the diamond I realized the that I'm going to be carrying this is one it. time I realized I'm wearing the diamond. The Empathy Museum presents Mail and My Shoes. So these are a size eight and a half black leather with a sort of suede front. They've got a heel on them as well. They're sort of dressy shoes, but you can't quite tell whether or not they are for a man or a lady. They're sort of gender neutral. There's no laces on this shoe. They are just to be slipped on. I mean, they're not so dressy, but they're not so casual either. Wednesday night, you'd probably go to the cinema with them on. They're made by Munro American. Latex, natural rubber. But yeah, gender neutral shoes. These shoes belong to Paddy Creevy. This is her story. My name's Paddy Creevy. Just recently, I retired from the wonderful position I had in being the mayor of Mandarin. I grew up in um, a working class family in West End. And I think one of the defining things in my life was being drawn to uh, a religious vocation. From an early age, um, primary school, I found myself praying to be guided. Now that was interesting because my family certainly wasn't religious. At about 17 and a half, I managed uh, to talk my way into entering the <clears throat> Sisters of the Good Shepherd. In terms of that order, who dealt with uh, disturbed adolescents, I was considered to be very young. But I actually got a chance to talk to the person in charge of the order Australia-wide and impressed on her that really, uh, having worked at a car yard as a typist and uh, had about two years' experience out of school, I was well suited uh, to join this order. What was it about being a nun that became so important for me? I just sort of felt this was what I was meant to do. And with all the enthusiasm of a young person, I just embraced that wholeheartedly. To enter the order, as was the custom in those days, you had to have a dowry. Uh, I had a job as a typist, uh, which I gave most of that money to my parents because uh, I was living at home. So I had to really find another way of uh, trying to put the money together to get this. So. I got the opportunity, coming from a long line of punters, to be given a job at the what was then called the Tote, now the TAB. And that money, that's what got me into the convent. So this was a huge deal. Uh, we're going back to like 1960, 61. Going to Melbourne was like going to another planet. And I remember the, the vivid scene at the train station, mum in tears, dad trying not to cry and me thinking I was on this most incredible adventure. I always remember an uncle I was very fond of coming up to me and said, good luck girl, you got more hide than Ned Kelly. We went to the Abbotsford Convent. At that time, the order was what was called a semi-enclosed order. So it had a farm, they made all their own clothes, their own bread. The doctor and the dentist came in, it was postal voting. They ran a commercial laundry. It was the biggest laundry in the, in the Southern Hemisphere because there were no subsidies or government grants. So what we relied on was getting money from the laundry to run this huge operation. At any one time, there could be about a thousand people it was a very structured life. There was a lot of prayer, a lot of learning, uh, and then there was the value that was placed on work because the, it was custodial care for these uh, young people who'd been sent by the courts. And the feeling was in those days that if you could keep them off the streets, teach them to work, because it was full employment around that time, then they would have a better chance in life. It wasn't discovered till quite later on that really what made things work was if people were able to establish a relationship. I was in my mid-twenties and had finished all the initial training and I suffered a major depression. I was working in the Brisbane convent at that stage, went to a local doctor, didn't know it was depression, never heard of depression. He um, put me on Largactyl, which, um, well, I think it's off the list now, and it was certainly not used for just someone feeling a bit down. But I, I was so unsettled, I took three months' leave, got 
a job uh, cooking in a local hostel, again, to support myself because my parents weren't in a position to do that. Um, it's a very isolating time, very difficult time. But at the end of the three months, I thought, well, I should go back. I transferred back to Melbourne and uh, obviously the depression wasn't going away. Sent to see a psychiatrist and then uh, was given shock treatment for five weeks, three times a week, which was a uh, you know, pretty terrible experience at the time, especially from what I know now, it was not really the appropriate treatment. One day I just felt so overwhelmed that I, I took a lot of the medication, not really wanting, I think, to kill myself, just wanted to go to sleep and not have to deal with it anymore. And I was very fortunate that the person, the nun that was in charge, who I got on with very well, happened to come to my room, figured out what was going on. By this stage, I was literally feeling no pain and she insisted that and in fact begged me crying if I would go to the hospital and woke up in intensive care having um, had the last rites and sort of almost well I think think they might have brought me back and I remember being wheeled from intensive care in St Vincent's Hospital up to their their psychiatric ward you know it was a locked ward the windows were only open to about six inches so there I was, no money, totally dependent on someone coming to see me, and mental illness was not really understood. And so I could see the nuns arriving and going to visit people who had other conditions in the hospital, but only one person came to see me. And I felt really isolated because I couldn't call anybody, I couldn't talk to anybody apart from the people in the ward. And the problem I then had is that I refused to take any more medication and I felt very sane. So I spent the next two weeks um, trying to convince them that I was sane. Finally, the, the nun in charge of Australia came to see me and um, agreed that uh, I'd be sent to Perth. Now, I think that was the furthest outpost of the empire and, um, you know, that was all they could think of doing. But that was the best thing that could have happened to me because it was there that my life really turned around. So this was the last throw of the dice in terms of religious life for me. And um, the sister in charge, Sister O'Brien, uh, the closest person to a saint I've ever met, she insisted I go and get some training. I thought, I, c I can't do that. No one in my family had ever been to university. So I got into social work through the back door in, at what was then Wait. After a little while, about three and a half years, uh, by then I was studying, washing dishes at the Herdsman Hotel, had my Suzuki 9cc scooter with the psychedelic eagle on the helmet. I knew just in a knowing that much and all as I loved these people, believed in what they were doing, I knew I had to move on. Uh, that was very, very difficult. It was probably the time I was probably the most alone in lots of ways. And it was after I'd graduated as a social worker that I realised something that I hadn't been aware of really, and that was that my sexual orientation was that I was gay. And, you know, I didn't really know anything about this type of sexuality. Um, you know, it wasn't a big feature. I'd not been in a relationship before I entered. So this was like being a teenager in your 30s and... Uh, after a fairly disastrous relationship, I then was very fortunate to have two wonderful relationships, including the one I'm in now, and had a social work career that, you know, was just uh, fantastic for me. Interesting, I ended up being in charge of social work services at Royal Perth and Ward 9. And certainly my own experience of depression and psychiatry certainly helped me uh, look at things quite differently. And then when I went to Mandra, again working in community health, someone said to me, would you consider running for council? Well, I'd only ever paid my rates, sometimes the dog licence, been very noisy at one meeting, but knew nothing really about local government, but had a go and got elected. When I became mayor, even though I had a lot of experience in local government, nothing really prepared me for the fact that you have to be a leader. Being a leader came down to really focusing on the relationships, trying to connect with all the parts of our very changing community. 
I was really fortunate that I'd had the social work background, I suppose the religious background, and tried to do that role based on values. Now, I didn't succeed all the time in that, obviously. I'm not at your shadow was one of my sayings. I'm certainly very aware of my, my shortcomings. I felt that when I was in the community, people knew that I really did care what happened to them and to the community. And uh, that feedback was quite sustaining, even though in politics, you know, not everybody's going to be happy with what you do. Paddy's story was produced by Mary Fatten. Her shoes are part of a growing collection of footwear hosted by the Empathy Museum's A Mile in My Shoes exhibition. The shoes and stories come from all over the world. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram to find out where we are going next. <laughs>